Okay, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Guess where we are today? If you can't tell by the change in scenery behind me, um, we are at the Bluebird House in Loosedale, Mississippi. And you can see we're still a work in progress. Still lots of things to be done, like lighting and uh, well, if you just walk through here, you could see all that needs to be done. <laughs> but at this point, we can begin to see what it will look like as a hospitality house for uh, ministers coming here to do programming with HRN or for people, you know, just in a place of uh, in a place of need in a transition. And so it's been lots of work over the last couple of weeks, but now that we can begin to see, you know, better what it will be, it's exciting. And we know from this point on, it, it should only get better in terms of uh, adding the little, I don't know if you'd say loving touches, but I think that's exactly what they are. They're, it, it sounds kind of, you know, uh, silly, maybe, or whatever, huggy, but I don't mind because, you know, for the people who are able to come stay here, we want it to, to feel to them like they've entered into a very peaceful place in the kingdom where they can recharge uh, and get ready for whatever it is they are called to do when they go out those, those double doors out front. Um, so what I'd like to do today is something a little bit different than what you're used to. We've been doing the footstep series. And what I've noticed, it, sometimes they they do away with the chat where I can't read it. And so you don't always know what's been said. But um, what I have noticed sometimes is that when I refer to something out of workbook one, which is where we really started with the creation gospel, because there've been lots of new people jump into the study, a lot of them during the footstep series, they're not really familiar with what we're talking about when we talk about something that happened on day two of creation or especially day four of creation. And so I don't want to give you the whole course. Of, I can't. It's impossible. It's, it's too comprehensive. But I want to give you just a sample today. And if you like the sample, if that interests you, then I hope that you'll uh, follow up and contact Keisha Gallagher at graceintora.net. And I think it's, wait, don't write that down. Go back to the cash, the chat box. I think it's um, Keisha at graceintora.net. Keisha, K-I-S-H-A. Keisha at graceintora.net. And she'll be starting a Zoom class in January, January 26th. And especially if you're in a, like say South Africa or Europe, I think because she's holding it earlier in the day here in the States, I think it'll be beneficial for you guys who it's it's a hardship sometimes to jump on, you know, when when we're doing stuff here in the States. And so it'll be particularly friendly to people in South Africa, Europe, and, and so forth. Um, if you've maybe been putting off taking the course because it was just at a difficult time for you. So look into that if, if it... If it I don't want to say if it strikes your fancy. I hope it doesn't strike your fancy. I hope it just speaks to your spirit. Um, that's the important thing, right? So let me get a recording started. And of course, this study that we're going to do today is just a sample of the creation gospel, just a sample. As you know, the creation gospel is a whole series of workbooks, but the foundational workbook, workbook one, it takes you from the seven days of creation to the seven spirits of Adonai to the seven feasts of Adonai to the seven assemblies of Revelation. And the, the point of stacking those layers of seven like that is to show you that once you learn the paradigm of the creation, once you learn the paradigm of the seven days of creation, then you will better, better be able to grasp the seven spirits of Adonai and Isaiah. You'll understand how important it is for you to celebrate the biblical feasts. Uh, you will understand why these seven messages to the seven assemblies in Revelation 
they're not just random messages, nor are they specifically for a historical uh, group in one specific historical period. What you'll see is that every single one of those messages reflects one of the seven feasts of Adonai. And I think that's why this study is important. It gives you that paradigm. It, it helps you to understand how this paradigm works. And once you figure that out and learn how to use it, then you will start to see that pattern all through scripture, showing you the seven assemblies of revelation, which of course we won't have time to do that today. And that's why I'm hoping you know, that you'll purchase the workbook if you don't have it already, or that you'll go to YouTube maybe and watch the whole series uh, on our YouTube channel that you will continue. And you say, well, where can I find out more about the workbooks? Where can I find out more about the programs? Just go to our um, website, which is www.thecreationgospel.com. And not only can you see the, the full range of workbooks and so forth that are built on this seven days of creation paradigm, it'll also tell you the story of what the proceeds of the workbooks go to, which is Lamala Children's Center, an orphanage that we have in Kenya. And it's very important to us that the books sell well, not because I need people to buy my books, but because uh, we need this to support these kids. A lot of the, the group that we have now is getting older, they're going to high school, we're thinking about college. And so we're, we're always trying to sell books so that we can uh, pay for expenses. But I think that's a great thing for us to be busy with in the kingdom if we're going to do something, if it's within our hand to do it, to do it for the kingdom. So I'd like to share with you today something that I'm very excited about, which is the creation gospel. And it's been a while since I've actually taught this introductory paradigm. I've I've left it to Keisha Gallagher really to coordinate the, the foundational level at this point so that I can race on. And, and we've been, you know, learning the Song of Songs, the Footsteps of Messiah, doing some in-depth uh, Torah portion teaching. But this is this is the beginning. So it's a good idea to go back and just refresh our beginnings sometimes and to, to stay excited about these days, I don't even call it a small beginning. It was a rocket lift off of a beginning when I first started teaching this, which this paradigm, it just grew out of teaching Torah portions. So that's, it wasn't any great thing where I woke up one morning and I had this wonderful download. It was just a process of teaching Torah portions. And out of those Torah portions, I began to see the paradigm and eventually just crystallized it into to one thing to make it easier for other people to learn. So I'm going to share my screen with you so that you can see what I see. And um, just a few notes here. Sometimes people question, you know, what version of the Bible is that that you're quoting from? Typically, it's going to be the NASB. And that's not because I think the NASB is the best Bible ever. It's because it's simple. And we need to speak in a known tongue for English speakers. And so as we progress in the study, um, if we need to look into the Hebrew, which we do, we really, really do. When we get into talking about the seven spirits of Adonai, we need to use very specific Hebrew words because they have such intense meanings. Uh, and so we, we begin to use more of the Hebrew when we get into the seven spirits and the seven feasts, of course. Uh, but to begin with, to start out, we want to make sure that we understand each other. And that's, that's you know, we, I just chose New American Standard because it is a very easy one to understand. There's no doctrinal point behind it. And, and I want to remind you, too, these graphics are copyrighted and um, they shouldn't be shared or forwarded without permission. Why is that? Again, because the proceeds of the creation gospel go to support not just the orphanage in Kenya, but if we have extra money, we also support one in India and then a girl's home in Peru. So it's that's why it's important to me. You know, the scripture is free. It belongs to everybody. But with the creation gospel, we also want to make sure that anybody using the graphics we know why they're doing that because there's all sorts of, you know, crazy people out there who might take your things and, and distort them. And then people think that's what you're teaching. And I, I, I can get into trouble all by myself. Thank you. I don't need help. Um, 
And that's the thing to remember, um, the proceeds of the creation gospel, they do go uh, to help some kids in need. And if you wanna purchase workbooks, please don't do it on Shabbat, but you can find out more on our website, thecreationgospel.com. You can purchase through Amazon. If you don't like Amazon, you can just order it through your local bookstore. Your local bookstore can order these. And uh, if you say, well, I don't know about reading through a workbook. I, I kind of thought I left my workbook days behind me. Then just watch it on YouTube. There's a channel called Halisa Elwine, and I teach all the way from the beginning to the end of workbook one. And it won't cost you a thing to do that. So here's a graphic of the paradigm that we use. And in this graphic, it, it gives you an overview of everything that you would cover if you did workbook one. And so we start out with the seven days of creation. We uh, discuss and we will discuss today the, the prophetic implications of the creations of the seven days so that we can see them as symbols of prophecy. In other words, if you want to, want to understand the, the beast and the man in the book of Revelation, then you better understand the sixth day of creation or you'll probably get off track a little bit. Uh, we discuss the seven spirits of Adonai, and that's when it becomes very important for us to begin uh, maybe looking at some Hebrew, uncovering Hebrew words and names for things because it, it, it has more meaning in Hebrew and it, it will help elucidate some things. Then we'll go through the seven feasts if you do the long workbook. And like I said, finally, you'll go through those seven assemblies of revelation so that you can see those seven assemblies really are teaching you about the importance of the seven feasts. Right, so that's kind of an overview of where we're going. And lest we think that the, the creation is confined to Genesis 1 and 2, Paul tells us differently. In Colossians 1.23, he says, if indeed you continue in the faith, firmly established and steadfast, and not moved away from the hope of the gospel that you have heard, which was proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, was made a minister. So this gospel was proclaimed in all creation. You know, even that little fly that's, that's you know, rat-a-tat-tatting across the back of the chair over there. The gospel was proclaimed in all creation. That fly is doing the fly things uh, that were important in the creation. But the gospel itself, that's why I say there's symbols in these seven days of creation that are very important because those symbols keep showing up in scripture. And once you establish their meaning in Genesis 1, then as you move through the rest of scripture, like I say, if you see man and beast on day six of creation, then you'll figure out what's going on with man and beast in Revelation. Although there is some stuff to fill in in between. <laughs> It's I don't. It's not as easy as I make it sound. But then on the, the other hand, it is that easy, right? So let's just break it down. Um, and like I say, it, this is in no way the depth that you can go into if you watch the videos uh, or if you do the workbooks. But we're going to hit the highlights. So I'm, I'm hoping it will make you interested to seek out some more. And if you were in one of my long seminars, this is where I would say, you need to start taking notes. There's some things you're going to need to remember. And one of the most important things you can do for yourself, and I know we hate memorization at this point in our lives, but it's still important. You need to memorize the days of creation and what was created on each day in order. A lot of people get one and four mixed up. We don't want you to get one and four mixed up. We want you to learn it in the correct order. And that way it will be more meaningful. It'll help you to use the pattern effectively. So what happens in the beginning? There is sheet in Hebrew. In the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. And, of course, this is going to be the first name of God that's used in Scripture, Elohim, which typically means judge. Why is it that the judge... Uh, is associated with the creation. 
because judges are seen as being kind of strict, uh, setting boundaries, enforcing the law. Well, if we think about it, we're about to face a chaos. The only way to bring order to a chaos is to be an Elohim, to be a judge, to set the boundaries, to make the restrictions, because once you set the boundaries, make the restrictions, set the rules, now you've created a platform for life. So for life and freedom to be there, we must first have Elohim. We must have the judge who can set our boundaries in the creation. So in the beginning, God, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Just one day. So let's back up. If you are taking notes, then I'm going to help you out a little bit. If you're not taking notes, these are just things to remember. The first word of the Bible, Bereshit, is translated in English as in the beginning. And as we're reading the Gospels, think of a Gospel that starts out like that. In the beginning was the word, right? So there's really nothing in the so-called New Testament that wasn't sourced out of what came in what we would call the Old Testament. It's not really old, it's older. <laughs> it's the ancient way. It's the way that we're supposed to look back to for understanding where we are today. So it was in the beginning. He created heavens and the earth. And the idea here, as, as we would progress through scripture, is that the earth was created as a type of mirror of something in the heavens. It reflects the will on earth of what is in heaven. Where did Moses and where did David get the plans for the tabernacle in the temple? They saw something in the heavenlies and what they drew up on earth was supposed to reflect what was seen in the heavenlies. It says the earth was formless and void and darkness was over the surface of the deep. So we start out with darkness. But what is happening even in that darkness? Well, it says the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. So this judge Elohim, he is preparing, he is basically brooding over the surface of the waters. And that movement there, if, if we look that up, how the ruach, ruach is spirit in Hebrew, as it's moving, it's the same motion that a mother hen makes when she's flapping her wings over her little chicks. It's a pretty violent motion. If you read it in Hebrew, it's, it's fairly violent. And so the thing I like for my students re to remember from this part is that the very first mention of the Ruach, the very first mention of the Ruach, and there is a rule called the rule of first mention in scripture, that it becomes your guiding principle for when you're going to see that word ever after in scripture. The first thing that Elohim wanted you to know about his spirit was that it was moving. His spirit is alive. It's moving. Even when it doesn't look like it's doing anything, it's moving. That's the first way we're supposed to think of his raw, moving. And then he says, let there be light. And there was light. Now, what do we know about light? Well, we're told in scripture that the Torah is a light and the commandment is a lamp. We might call this a proto-prophecy. Uh, we might call this a paleo prophecy. I'm, I'm not sure how we would put this, but right here we see that one day the children of Israel are going to receive a document of light that is called the Torah. And in the darkness of the earth, there will be light. Now there will be a people of Elohim 
who were able to walk in the light and who were able to light their way with the commandment, with the lamp. So let there be light. The Torah is a light. The commandment is a lamp. And a commandment, we call that an equivalent expression. If the Torah is a light and the commandment's a lamp, those are equivalent. They're not identical. They're equivalent. And so the Torah is this big, infinite light. It's like if you walk out in the, in the sunlight in the day, how can you grab that light? You can't. It's everywhere. That's the Torah. But if you say, well, I need some light because I need to crawl under the house and, and check out my water pipes. Well, what do you need for that? You need a concentrated light that you can aim in a particular direction because you don't want to crawl straight into a critter under your house. So you need a flashlight. You need a lamp. And that's what a lamp is. It's a focused light. It's a light you can do something with. And so the Torah is the light, but honor your father and mother is a lamp. And when we honor our father and our mother, then it's a focused light. It's observable. Others can see us honoring our father and our mother. And in that sense, is it still light? Absolutely. But it's practical. It'll change your life today when you do a commandment. See, you can walk around and say, oh, I do Torah. But my question is, yeah, but do you keep the mitzvot? Because the mitzvot, the commandments, they are a lamp. And people can see you doing that. They're observable, measurable. If uh, you keep the Sabbath day, people can see that. They can see that you don't go to work. They can see that you don't kindle a fire. There are observable things in the commandments of the, the Sabbath of the Shabbat where it's focused, it's concentrated, and now you become a witness. You become a testimony to the light. Same thing with the, the feasts of Adonai. When you say, I keep Torah, but do you keep the feasts? Because those are observable. If you observe the Passover, then I can observe what you're doing on the Passover, that you're keeping those commandments. They're observable. They're transformative. And that's what Yeshua said. He says, do this in remembrance of me. Let people observe what you're doing because then you become a testimony and they can ask questions and they can learn about the light. And they can begin to walk in the light of the Torah in an observable way. And so once it says that he saw the light, he sees that it's good. And so something happens here. He has separated the light from the darkness. And so he calls the light day and the darkness he calls night. Now, as we move through scripture, this will magnify. Uh, for those of you who are interested in prophecy and you read in the prophets a lot or you read in Revelation a lot, you will be able to build on this and say, not only is the light of the Torah day, and there is a darkness called night, you will see that there are periods of history where the darkness or the night refers to times of exile, when Israel is outside of the land, outside of Jerusalem, unable to keep some of the commandments, such as the feasts. Um, and then there's the times that are called the light of the day where you can walk in the light of his commandments, where you can obey the commandments fully. So even way back in day one, you can see prophecies that there will be times of obedience for Israel and there will be times of disobedience when they will be pushed out into the exile. At any rate, he wants us to be separated from the darkness. He wants us to engage in the light. And one thing about being separated a lot of times people think holiness is being set apart and that's wrong. That's only the first step. The first step of holiness is to be separated from something that is dark. The second step of holiness is to be gathered 
to like kind and like mind. He'll separate you from one thing in order to gather you to another. If you were only separated, then here's what's going to happen. Day two. <laughs> and on day two, there is only separation. Then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, the waters of the Mayim, and let it separate the waters from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven or Shemayim. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. So if being set apart is all that wonderful, then why wasn't it declared good? That's the question of the second day. Well, actually it is good. It's just not going to be declared good until the third day, until this critical thing happens that we're talking about. If you're just separating, in a sense, you're just dead. There's nothing happening. So when the, the waters were separated out, it's preparatory to something, but it's not finished yet. So we can't just be happy being set apart from one thing until he shows us what we are gathered to. Because just to be separated again, it's like being dead. If your soul is separated from your body, or your spirit is separated from your body, we call that being dead. So separation is death. Unless he simply separates you from one thing in order to gather you to another. That's an important principle of the second day. So as he progresses, that takes us into the third day. And as you're reading here about the third day of creation, you can see that there will be two declarations of goodness. And let's see what makes it good. Remember, at this point, there's only separation. He's only separated the waters from the waters. But it, it's not good. It says, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Okay, now it's good. On day two, all he did was separate one from the other. In terms of the waters, it's not good just to be separated, but it is good to be separated and then gathered because when it's the gathering of the waters, then it allowed the dry land to appear. Why do we need dry land? Well, the human beings who are going to be the crown of his creation on day six, he has to have the dry land in order to create the human beings. So I said, it's not good just to be separated. It's good to be separated and then gathered to like kind and like mind. And so it takes us into a second stage of the third day. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. That was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning, a third day. Now, this second part of the third day is critical. It's critical that you see something important here. When you hear repetition in scripture that seems to be unnecessary, then you know that it's absolutely necessary. When you see repetition in scripture that seems unnecessary, it's absolutely necessary. So when he says plants, he says it's, it's, he's not emphasizing just plants. He's emphasizing here plants yielding seed and fruit trees. 
And then it says on earth bearing fruit, how? After their kind with seed and them. Now, what is the seed? The seed is the word. Yeshua taught us the parable of the seed. The seed is the word. So now we have a proto-prophecy of the word itself. We had the light of the Torah on the first day of creation. Therefore, we had the commandments of the Torah. Commandments of the Torah. But we also know this, the Torah is the word. Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So on the third day of creation, we have more proto-prophecy of the word itself. Even before there's a human being to obey the word, there's the prophecy of the word, the seed. And this seed of the word bears fruit. And in bearing the fruit, the very fruit that the word yields holds the seeds of the next tree and the next fruit. That's the nature. And we know that human beings are often compared to trees in scripture. In fact, there's this big, long conversation among the trees that you can tell it's, it's a parable of human beings. We are called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Uh, we will be like trees planted by rivers of living water. There's all sorts of prophecies associated with people and trees. And so even before, again, there's a human being on earth, there are the trees that prophesy of the human being that's coming a couple days later. See, you, you can see the, the accordion value, the fractal value of prophecy in Genesis 1, that, that you could take this one symbol and say, oh my goodness, it's, it's not just prophesying forward lots of, you know, hundreds of years, it's just prophesying a few days. You know, the, the trees, the fruit trees from the third day to the sixth day. And another thing that's important, not just the seed, but that these trees of righteousness would have seed in them that bears fruit, which is exactly what Yeshua commanded us to do, to bear fruit. To bear the fruit of the spirit. Well, what was moving on the first day? The spirit itself. The spirit moves things. When the spirit moves on us, we begin to bear fruit with the word in it. And we bear after our kind with seed and them. We have a kind. Remember, you're separated from one thing in order to be gathered to like kind and like mind. You need to surround yourself with people who also have the seed in them. And it makes you stronger and better at bearing fruit for the sake of those who need that fruit with the seed of the word in it so that they can also become those fruitful trees. And after their kind is not a random phrase. We're going to hear that again on day six. And again, if you want to understand Revelation and the tension between the man and the beast in Revelation, then we have to understand after their kind in the creation week. Since the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind, and God saw that it was good. Evening and morning, a third day. All right? There's also a principle associated with the third day other than the fruit, the tree. Uh, the seed, the seed of the word. There is also uh, in the, the number three, of course, we're reading about the third day, the principle of resurrection. Where do we get the principle of resurrection? Where do we get the doctrine of resurrection? Well, we can trace it all the way back here to day three because the, the text is so careful to talk to us about the seed and the hope is in the seed. The resurrection is in the seed. What seems to have died and been buried will grow and live again. And so embedded in this proto-prophecy on the third day is a principle of resurrection embedded here. And again, with the trees as symbols of human beings being resurrected 
How are they going to be resurrected? They're going to be resurrected by the seed. They're going to be resurrected by the seed of the word. And who is the seed of the word? Yeshua is the word. Yeshua is the living word, which is how the gospel of John starts out. He is the word. This is how we will resurrect. And it says, after their kind. The righteous will resurrect with him because we are after his kind. And this is good. This is very good. Um, and also, which, like I say, we're only going to look at the creation in this study today. Uh, but if you do the full study, then you would continue. You would study the seven spirits of Adonai listed in Isaiah, and you would see how this day uh, is associated with the third spirit, which is called counsel, the spirit of counsel. But in Hebrew, it's it's a, it's a. and it's and Hebrew is tree. So the very spirit of counsel is a resurrection spirit. Uh, he is our wonderful counselor. Why? Because he can resurrect us from the dead. And so the, the very name of the spirit, it's uh, is associated with the tree itself. Or we might say the tree is associated with it's uh, the eights is associated with the eights. Uh. The tree is associated with the spirit of counsel. Next. This is a very important day, day four. And again, if you look at a menorah, you saw how on the graphic to start out, it was placed on the menorah. There's a reason for that because we teach the whole paradigm in reference to the menorah. And a menorah is chiastic in its structure. It's not like we learn in the West, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, even though chapter one goes in that chronological order. But it also hints to the chiastic order of things. And scriptures are written in chiasms, which means the most important principle is in the middle instead of at the beginning or the end. In fact, it's this most important principle in the middle that is kind of encapsulated and surrounded by the things around it. In that sense, Day four would be the most interesting day of creation because everything we read about day four, we would see some form of it branched out into these other six days of creation. Because with the menorah, remember, it started out as just one piece of beaten gold. And out of that one piece of beaten gold, they beat out six more branches. So it was the middle branch here that was the main piece. So everything we read about in these three days of creation or these three days of creation, they represent something that occurred on day four. So it says, then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. There's the separation. Didn't we see that on day one when he separated the light and the darkness? Well, if the principle, if this is the essence, if, if the middle, the axis holds all the information that we need, and separation is a main verb for day four, then we can see why separation would also be reflected on day one. He's going to separate the light from the darkness. On day two, he's going to separate the waters from the waters. On day three, he's going to separate the waters from the dry land. There's separation here. There's separation here. What is happening? Holiness, separation in order to gather to like kind and like mind, to produce fruit with seed in it. If there's lights on day four, there was light on day one. God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons. The seasons there in Hebrew is moedim. Moedim, if you're gonna learn any Hebrew words, learn moedim because these are the feast days. These are the seven feasts of Israel. That's why Israel was commanded to observe them, to be a light to the nations. And it says it's also for days and years. Let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And this is the nature of light. Light always gives. Light doesn't take. Light gives. So that's a message to us. If you were learning the word, 
If you are learning the light of the Torah, it's so that you can give. Light always gives. It's not a taker. So it says God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. So a key verb here is not just to separate. The second key verb here is to govern. Rulership, authority is associated with the number four. And especially with this particular day of creation. <clears throat> In fact, all the way to the book of Revelation, the number four will be identified with authority and governing. The fourth assembly of Revelation, which is Thyatira, he talks about how I will, uh, I will appoint you also to sit down on my throne with me and govern with me, just as I have received authority from the Father. So I will give authority to you if you will be faithful. And so again, that separation, if spiritual authority is part of day four, you can see that spiritual authority would be branched out to these other days. So the, the greater light to govern the day, the lesser night, lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Again, proto-prophecies. Uh, yesterday on day three, he made trees as symbols of human beings. Now he's making stars, which can also be symbols of human beings. Remember, he takes Abraham outside and he says, Abraham, look at the sky. Count the stars if you're able. So shall the number of your seed, your seed be. Who are Abraham's seed? Those who are trees who have the seed and their fruit, the seed of the word and their fruit. These are the children of Abraham. They are like the stars. They give testimony to the word. They give testimony to the light. God placed them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. What are we here to do? Give light on the earth. Give the Torah on the earth. Give the word of Adonai on the earth. To keep the commandments on the earth as a light and a testimony. It says, and to govern the day and the night. And to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning, a fourth day. So you see the repetition there, to govern, to govern. So there's a couple of things. If you can't remember anything else about this little introduction, you can remember two things about day four. The number four represents governing and authority. And it represents a separation, separating things out in order to gather them together. Just like there are, even in the constellations, there are certain constellations of the stars that send a particular message, right? And they are separated from other stars. They're grouped together as a testimony, just like... Um, you know, the, the 12 tribes are associated with certain constellations of the stars. And there's a meaning associated with each of those 12 constellations. And it's just telling the gospel so that through the course of the year, uh, of course, astrology has commandeered that and, and, you know, done bad things with it. Doesn't change the fact that there is a witness in the stars for a reason, symbols for us to look at and to be reminded that they are for signs and for seasons for Moedim. And so understanding the movement of the sun and the movement of the moon helps keep us on track with our Moedim or our feast days. Those are important parts of the testimony that we keep. Okay. So on today, um, five next, but I, I did want you to see this graphic of the feasts so that you could see a little bit about why would there be seven feasts in scripture? Well, we know it starts with Passover and it ends with Sukkot. And then there's an eighth day of Sukkot. Uh, but 
you can see how with the menorah that even though we see, we typically see this right here, the, the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as long as we add that spiritual aspect that is unseen, we can see how these Moedim or these feasts, they move in the cycles and the circles, which is what Moedim is. It's seasons, things that keep coming around. They keep rehearsing. And so to be in synchronization, we keep his feasts and it, it keeps us in time. And as we get into Genesis 2, and we start reading the creation again from the standpoint of Genesis 2. Genesis 2 actually describes it in this circular pattern. And that, that's really going to help us to understand why the feasts are important. Not just because they're in the Torah, but because they were prophesied from day four of creation. From the standpoint of being separated from other people to our own kind. And from the standpoint of governing that these feasts were there to, even before a human being, to govern our times. And it is not for mankind to create the calendar. It is for the creator to create the calendar. And then as man is placed into this garden in these circling rivers of Eden of the garden, then he comes into synchronization with the plan of heaven, with the heavenly authority. So when we keep the feast, we are proclaiming the authority of the creator over the universe. For the universe right now knows it or not, chooses to obey or not, is irrelevant. We're saying, I don't care what you do. As for me and my house, we are going to keep the appointed times. We are going to keep the feast because he created these for us. He prepared these things for us, for life and for good. And that's why we're separated from other people. That's why we're set apart. We are set apart from pagan or heathen or just man-made calendars in order to observe his cycles, to proclaim his authority with those who also are of the same mind and kind which takes us to day five. I love day five. It's a fun day in terms of prophecy. Uh, I love doing day five when we do the full study. Uh, it says, then God said, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of the heavens. God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. There was evening and there was morning, a fifth day. So do you see the repetition here? The birds and the fish, they are going to swarm after their kind. And again, this is all leading us up to day six, when the beasts and the human being were created. The beasts after their kind, but the human being is going to be created after a different kind. So scripture is being very careful to point out to us the animals are after their kind. Don't confuse yourself with them. When repetition seems unnecessary, it's necessary because we consistently confuse ourselves with, with monkeys and, you know, all this stuff. He says, don't confuse yourself. Know who your kind is. And the Hebrew word, like I say, we, we, do need to go into Hebrew when we do this study. The Hebrew word there for teeming and swarming, it comes from a Hebrew word that means to run, rats, rats to, to run fast. So if, if you were trying to explain to somebody what this ver verb would look like, you would say, okay, close your eyes and visualize millions and billions and billions of 
moving feet. <laughs> That's what it means. So when these birds fly, it's, it's a reproductive quality to it. And it's multiplication. <clears throat> and in that sense, now we get a better understanding of the gospel. Because if, if you think of what happened up through day three, up to the trees, yes, the Torah is there. The commandments are there. Separation is there. But where's the movement? We know that the spirit of Elohim was moving on the surface of the waters. <clears throat> so where's the advantage of that movement? Well, there's trees that tells us water's moving, but it's limited. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. The seed won't go far from the tree. But <clears throat> what if? What if a bird picks up the seed and carries it? Now it'll go much farther. <clears throat> now it'll go faster, excuse me. Farther and faster with the help of the birds because they're teeming and swarming. So you've got a, a revealed world, the birds of the heavens, and then you've got a concealed wor world, which is going to be the fish of the, the waters. They're both supposed to be fruitful and multiply. So what we can see in the birds swarming, teeming, flying in the heavens we know that there's also a concealed world below it in the waters that's doing exactly the same thing. We've got two realms there. But the seed of the word, now the gospel, it can move much faster. Instead of just falling under these trees and maybe the water moving it around, now we've got the swarms that can pick up the seed and move it a lot faster. They can move it all over the world. So it's no accident that Yeshua first picks fishermen. He starts calling people. He'll say, I will make you a fisher of men. Because again, we've got the proto-prophecies of the creation. I will make you fishers of men. I'm going to put the seed of the word in you, and you're going to be like little birds that fly. You're going to take this gospel. You're going to take this good news. You're going to take this seed of the word to disciple the nations. And now you're going to multiply. I mean, you're going to team. You're going to swarm. You're just going to, you're going to blow up and start multiplying like crazy. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the waters and the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. And actually, the seas can often represent the peoples, the nations. So he's saying, be fruitful, multiply, fill the nations and let the birds multiply. Let those who take the seed and carry it, those who are going to disciple others, let them multiply on the earth. And this is the fifth day. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? That even from the beginning, when Yeshua says, I will make you fishers of men, he's saying, I'm going to die and I'm going to resurrect on the third day. Think of the creation, the resurrections in the seed. But he says, I got to go to the Father. So it's during the Passover week. He's going to resurrect. He appears to his disciples and he does something interesting twice. After he resurrects, he appears to his disciples. And the first time, they're not really sure that it's him. And he says, it's really me. You can touch me. He says, do you have any fish? Now, he had to have had a little smile on his face when he, when he asked them that. Because they're not quite getting yet that they're about to literally go start fishing people. Just like this gospel says. And then he appears on the beach up in the, in the Galil, in the Galilee, and he's cooking fish. He's sending them every message that, guess what? Go back to the creation, guys. After he resurrects, then he's going to say, okay, now tarry in Jerusalem until you have received power from on high. Power in Hebrew is gvura. And 
this is the fifth day of creation, as Gura is the fifth spirit of Adonai. So this is the fifth day of creation. And now they will begin to move with Gura. They will begin to move with power. And that's what Yeshua told them. Stay there until the feast, until Pentecost, until Shavuot. There the power is going to fall on you. And then you can take it to the, the fifth day. You can take it to the fifth part of the prophecy. And then you can go fill the waters and the seas. You can multiply on the earth. You can spread the seed. And so that little tongue in cheek, do you have any fish? I would love to have been a fly on the wall and seen that. And just to see their faces, like, did they get a clue at all as to what he was saying? This is the next step of spreading the gospel. So why do you need to keep the feasts? So that you will be filled with the spirit to do exactly what you're do, as what you're supposed to do at the appointed times. <clears throat> and now our sixth day. This is very important. Like I said, if if you're a revelation buff, then you better be a six-day buff. You better know what's going on dynamically on this day. Because this is we, we first begin to sense the danger right here. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creepy things, and the beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Now, remember our rule. When you see repetition that appears to be unnecessary, it is absolutely necessary. After their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after their kind, after its kind. So we get the idea when he creates the beasts that it's very important for them to reproduce after their kind. And if they will reproduce after their kind, it's good. So on the sixth day of creation, the firstborn of that day is the beast. Now let's look at the second born of day six. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. Now, humankind is made in the image of Elohim. Humankind is not made in the image of the beast. We're very clear on who is made in the image of the beast. The beasts, they reproduce after their kind. But human beings, even though they also have a soul, animals have a soul. It's called a nefesh in Hebrew. Human beings also have a soul called a nefesh, which is actually what Yeshua came to save. He needed to save our souls, the animal, the thing that we have in common with an animal. So it says it's very important not to confuse yourself with an animal. It can be easy to do when you don't live according to the spirit. If you're living according to the move of the Ruach, there's no reason for you to confuse yourself with a beast. You are made in the image and in the likeness of Elohim. You are not in the image of the beast. And if you can remember that, then you can remember your original job which was to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle, over all the earth and every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. When we conform ourselves to the image of the beast, then we lose the ability to rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the cattle over all the earth and every creepy thing that creeps on the earth. In fact, it's the creepy things that rule over us. That's the difference. And this is why we have the prophecy of Esau and Jacob. Esau represents the beast. He's the firstborn. He was born red and hairy all over, like a beast. And he was always at the mercy of his appetites, just like an animal. An animal has a soul and a body. And a soul, or a nefesh, it's a bundle of appetites. 
appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. The spirit, the ruach, however, it does not rely on those things. It relies on the word. It relies on it is written. It does not rely on I think I feel I want. It relies on it is written. No matter what you think about it, no matter what you feel about it, no matter what you want. It is written. That is spiritual authority. And that's what Jacob represents, spiritual authority. So the soul, the animal thing that we have in common with animals, appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect, we're not trying to kill it. It's your life force. We're trying to discipline it according to the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit. When the spirit prevails over the soul, it's good. It's in the right order. Because remember, the prophecy is the older the beast, the soul, appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect, it's going to serve the younger, the human being made in the image of Elohim, the spirit, the spirit of Elohim ruling over us, and then the spirit of a human being ruling over his animal soul, appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect. That's what it means to conform to the image of Elohim. In Revelation, things are being ironed out so that those who conform to the image of the beast, who worship their appetite, emotion, desire, and intellect, they're being separated out to their own kind. But the righteous who conduct their lives based on it is written, not I think I feel I want like an animal, they're also being separated out for good. And so all this imagery of the red beast and the harlot and the woman and all that, it all starts to make sense if you can understand this one little paradigm. And so after that completeness, uh, then what happens is assuming that just like 1 Corinthians 15, 45 says, it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first Adam was at the mercy of his appetite. The last Adam, Yeshua, was a life-giving spirit who was not at the mercy of his appetite. It says, however, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, the beast came first, and then the spiritual, the human being. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. The human being had something that the, the animal world did not have. Yes, it had a living soul, but its spirit was from heaven itself. Its image was in heaven itself. And so often that's, that's the problem because the physical is revealed first. Uh, we lose the picture because we don't look at the spiritual aspect. We don't ask what's behind the natural, what's behind the physical. Well, we always, because we're human beings, we need to seek out what is the spiritual foundation? What moved first in the spirit realm before the natural was revealed? And this is what a human being was created to do. Okay. And then finally, it says, day seven, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts by the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it, he rested from all his work, which he created and made. And that's it. You see how there's not much attached to day seven? It's a day of completion. It's all done. Everything that's done day one through six, it's completed. And the only thing that will make that work more complete is for you to do nothing on the seventh day. <laughs> and I don't mean like don't physically move or do anything. It's just that whatever you do 
on the seventh day, it's an acknowledgement that he's already done all the work that could be done. And if we were to continue working on that seventh day, you're sending the message that, you know what, the work of Yeshua on my behalf wasn't good enough. Yeshua didn't finish his work. I need to finish up his work for him. Let me just redo what Yeshua did. And we don't want to do that. We want to rest on the seventh day and say, you know what, there's, there's nothing that Yeshua did that I can better, that I can do more or better and make more complete. We're already complete in him. And if we can acknowledge that, then we can dwell in a blessing. Because really, it's not a matter of whether we choose to sanctify the Sabbath. The first thing that's truly called holy, set apart, speaking of being set apart, it doesn't matter whether we observe it or not, whether we sanctify it or not, it already is. Just like the calendar, the Moedim, it already is. It doesn't matter whether you keep the feast or not, they're not going to change. They're always going to be there waiting, I guess up to a certain point, for you to jump in and get on his time clock, get on his calendar so that he can bless you in that place. Whether you keep it or not, it doesn't change what it is. It's still the Shabbat. It's still the Sabbath. Whether you rest from your work or not, doesn't matter. He's already completed his work of salvation for you. It's just a matter of whether you accept it and acknowledge it. And through acknowledging it, Remind the world that he is still the creator. He is still Elohim, the judge. He is still the king over kings. It's a beautiful thing. And so from there, that kind of wraps up uh, what we can do for a very quick introduction. Uh, but from there, we would start breaking things down. Um, we would spend even more time on the seven days of creation, an incredible amount of time on the seven spirits of Adonai that moved on those seven days of creation. I don't spend a lot of time on the feast because my assumption is you already know what those are and you're doing them. I uh, don't want to reinvent the wheel when there's so much good you know, information out there on the seven feasts. Um, and then by that point, people tend to be in overload. So I don't know how much of the seven assemblies they actually absorb, but over time it sinks in. It just takes a little time to, to get that initial three levels kind of stacked on top of one another. And then once you think you got a pretty good handle on that, we go to Genesis 2 and we start learning it in a circle. We take the rivers of Eden and we learn it in a circular pattern. So I hope that that helps um, those of you, again, who might have jumped in later. Um, maybe you haven't been around since 2003 or 2005 or <laughs> whenever it was. Um, but if you've jumped in since then and you never had a chance to do the creation gospel anywhere, then I hope that inspires you to either jump in the Zoom class with Keisha Maybe just start working on the workbook. Just use the, you can use the videos that are on YouTube. If you're good at kind of self-teaching. Um, I don't do a lot of long seminars anymore. It takes about a week. It, it takes about a week long commitment from both of us to get that done. And so that's why I'm so glad that Keisha's doing it. She's a great teacher starting a new class, January the 26th. She's very patient and you can, you can interact we, we do certify other people to teach it. And she's got other ladies helping her. And that way we make sure that people's questions are being answered. Um, what I've noticed as a teacher is if, if you say something and somebody gets hung up on that one thing, they won't hear anything else that you say because they're still working on that one thing rather than like write it down and like, okay, let me follow here. And sometimes that question might be answered five, 10, 15 minutes down the line but you've already disengaged and you won't hear that <laughs> because you're kind of stuck on it. Um, and that's easy to do. You know, it depends on what kind of a thinker you are, but having extra people there available for the class means that, uh, and you get a password to get into a band page or you can interact. Say, well, okay, I got a question about this right here or, or where is she getting this right here? I don't understand why she's saying the heaven is 
fire and water too. Where's I don't get that. She's using these Hebrew words. Well, you got people there who can answer that for you. Uh, and that's the beauty. I, I like for people to understand everything. I can't function as a, what would you call it? Concierge service for every question you have about what you're studying. Uh, that's just impossible for one human being to do because you can't possibly study and look at all the sources that everybody else sees. But I can be responsible for my own teaching and, you know, you know, Baruch Hashem, there's enough people that, that love this paradigm. More and more people are capable um, and competent at teaching it too, which is good news because it means that there's part of it you're not understanding. Then there's enough people out there to answer the questions, you know? Um, yeah, I, I hate getting stuck, but I also like getting stuck because when I get stuck, it reminds me that I haven't arrived, that I don't have the greatest brain on earth, <laughs> um, that no matter who we are, it's, it's important to stay humble as we study and to be grateful for every opportunity, no matter how challenging it might be, no matter how imperfect the situation, uh, if, if he can just drop a word into our lives each day, in spite of the noise of, of the day, then thank you, Father. That was a word. That was a seed that I had never received before or never understood before enough to let it start sprouting life in me. And, and not every seed sprouts life at the same time. And sometimes you just have to keep re <laughs> redoing that seed right there until you've grown to a place where all of a sudden it'll sprout. Like the light bulb, I think that should probably like be, instead of a light bulb idea over your head, I think that should be the, like the seed sprouting something out there. You know how they'll split open? Um, that's what I like about planting beans is sometimes they'll kind of heave up toward the surface if there's been a lot of rain and then it's dry. And you can literally see those, those jackets of the bean pulling back and then the bean just splitting and then the bean sprout coming up. And there's days my brain feels like that. <laughs> like I think my brain just split, but I just got an idea. Um, I don't know why I didn't get that the first 10,000 times I read it. Um, so don't, so don't, don't put so much pressure on yourself that you say, Oh my goodness, I, I, I did this study and I didn't understand half of it. Well, if you got half, great. You know how many years it took me? <laughs> um, time is, is, things are so instant nowadays, guys. I think we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to learn faster than we need to. Because if you're learning is there to transform your life. Um, and I think right now we're starting to have satellite problems. So if you guys can steer, I think we're frozen right now. Um, but whatever the satellite problem is, I guess I better sign off. And I'll type that in there for those of you if I am frozen. <laughs>